Ray, there's a prevailing belief among many physicists that philosophy is primitive physics. Mm -hmm. And the more we learn about physics, the less philosophy has to uh, contribute to the world, such that we are pretty much at a time where the definition of a good philosopher are those philosophers who keep the rest of the philosophers away from good scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, you fundamentally disagree with that, and I'd like to understand why. You bet. And it seems to me the problem comes not just from physicists, but from some philosophers who may be regarded, as it were, as having science cringe. You know, they cringe before science, as if science is going to offer us an answer to our metaphysical problems, as well as illuminating some aspects of the nature of the physical world. I think Susan Stebbing described it beautifully. She said, often physicists confuse the physical world with the world of physicists. That is to say, the notion that how things are described in physics actually encompasses how things are, even in the natural world. This couldn't be a more appropriate time for physicists to turn for, to philosophy and for, for philosophers to engage with physics. Because physics is in a real metaphysical mess. It's not just at the sort of headline level of the mm -hmm. failure to uh, unite quantum theory and general theory of relativity, but at the level of trying to understand the nature of time. Does it exist? Does it not exist? Physicists seem to be pretty careless about time. They pick it up and throw it down as required, you know, a little bit of T in an equation, a little bit of T out in an equation. But this is big stuff for those of us who are creatures in time. So there is certainly a role for philosophers. But what could that role be? It's not to help physics, physicists with their calculations. You know, they're not very good at sums, just like me. No, their role is to look at the concepts that are deployed as people make physical inquiry, in, in the kind of inquiries that physicists participate in. It's a conceptual analysis. It's also about saying, how can we reconcile what physicists tell us about the world with our experience of the world? What Is Wilfred Sellers talked about, he called the scientific image and the manifest image. How do they relate, even if you want to hand the palm to physics and say this is the final answer, you've still got to explain how we live inside a totally different answer. Then the answer would be from physicists is that the manifest image uh, is something that is derived in, in many different generations and or levels of hierarchies in science uh, through evolution, random or whatever that later d developed and is irrelevant in understanding fundamental reality. That all those things are uh, <coughs> scientifically generationally uh, developed and then culturally developed so that what, we're, what we think is this real kind of world of our experience is so far removed from the foundations of it, but all traceable by physical steps, that we think this is important when this is random and irrelevant, really, to understand fundamentals. You've already appealed to evolution. You've appealed to c cultural development. Clearly, this is exactly the kind of thing people fish around for when they're trying to uh, disregard the manifest image. It seems to be nothing particularly culturally relative. Uh, about the notion that there is a table out there that is solid, that is, it has some kind of continuity, even if in the eyes of physics it dissolves into something quite different. Well, but that comes through our sense, sense organs. I mean, we don't have, this is the realism, anti-realism debate about what I really know about the external world, and that's a whole other conversation, but it's real. I mean, it, 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 I don't really perceive this table as a table. I perceive it because various uh, uh, sense, sense, uh, sense modalities give me information which I then use to induce the fact that this is a table. There's an awful lot of agreement across the world you would find whether this is a table or not and whether it was in a particular place and so on. Mm -hmm. But I want to turn to the other, as it were, explanation uh, why physicists patronize, as it were, yeah. our everyday intuitions. They say, well, we were evolved to see these kinds of things. And I would say, if they were total illusions, evolution is clearly barking up the wrong tree. Because why would evolution, as it were, um, so design us to get a completely wrong ontology of the world. It would hardly be compatible with survival. What's more, evolution assumes the existence of the kind of macroscopic beings that physics can't handle, i.e. beasts like you and me, macroscopic large objects. They dissolve in the gaze of physics, so you can't invoke evolutionary theory, as it were, to explain why there is a distance between the world as it's seen through the eyes of physics, supposedly true, 
and the world as we see in everyday experience supposedly false. Okay, so you have two, two thoughts here, and let's try to unpack them. Uh, the first is that um, um, e evolution shouldn't give us a wrong perception of reality, because if it did, it, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Uh, not entirely clear, because what it takes to escape a, a jaguar or a lion on the steppes of Africa is not clearly the kind of, of, of uh, mechanism that necessarily would be the, the kind of thing that would allow me to write equations of quantum physics. Well, I mean, there's two, two radically different kinds of things. So escaping the jaguar, was that, was that the escapee and the escaper, were they both unreal objects in the end? But, but, but and was Africa and the idea of the past tense all of these things which you've just mobilized no, no, to explain all, why all those things are real but but the, the, well hang on a second if they are real yes. you, uh, then clearly uh, physics isn't the whole story well, well no i, I mean the, the they're real but but the what survived and and what was the fittest of the people who could run the fast and make it really simple run the fastest away or could spot the jaguar uh, from uh, a distance away from what oh, away from the predator so the predators are real uh, 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 yes, let's 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 go with that. It is real, but the the but the qualities that that enable that are not necessarily the qualities that would enable us to perceive the the world in a in an accurate way. When you when you get down to a different level of of uh, of perception, it's not the perception of a physical macroscopic object. It's being able to write equations for things that are you know ten to the minus twentieth in 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 in, in size. And totally radically different. So, so, they're, they're, so the science would say that's the real science that we have, and 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 the other and the and the other manifestations that have come out of that are the, if not illusions, they are not necessarily things that we need to consider in understanding fundamental reality. Running away from predators clearly is a different kind of skill from writing from doing, say, non-Euclidean geometry. Of course, totally different kind of skill. It's interesting how far we've gone from running away from predators to doing non-Euclidean geometry, it shows how far we've gone from our biology. But I would still say that your starting point for this evolutionary explanation of our manifest image of the world is that there really are objects out there, that they really exist, and they're quite unlike those objects as they're seen through the eyes of quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I mean, if it was a wave function coming at you, <laughs> running away would be pretty useless. Because, in fact, probably you're part of the same wave function. Oh, oh, um, oh okay. So, but, uh, but, uh, but how, how does, how, what follows from that, though? What follows from that is, in a sense, you're conceding that there is a ground floor, inescapable reality to these kinds of everyday objects, which science dissolves for very good reasons. You know, we get great use out of it. But if, if quantum mechanics was the final story or in, of, of material objects, including jaguars and people running away from them, then you can see how the image of people running away from okay. jaguars would not hold up. So, so now we're into the second part of, of your argument, which says that, that the, the macroscopic objects today are not uh, things that science um, uh, uh, understands or appreciates or knows how to deal with. Yeah. And th that is only clear in the state of, of, of current science. I mean, we're 300 years, 400 years into modern science and barely a century into quantum physics kind of, of science. So, I mean, this is, a, this this is, a, this this is, is an eye blink in, the, yeah. in even human history, much less universal history. So, yeah. so you're saying we can't understand macroscopic objects today, but we've barely started. This is something I call argument by promissory note. <laughs> you know, sooner or later, we'll eventually, science will break through, but the fact remains- but It's only been a couple hundred, few hundred years. Sure, but at the moment, People that are in invoking quantum mechanics to say, or basically uh, general theory of relativity, to say that our perception of the world is totally wrong. And I would say, it would seem to me, if that was the case, then your scenario uh, that we have evolved to see the world in this way in order to escape macroscopic objects set out in space time in the ordinary commonplace way wouldn't hold up. You can't, as it were, have your physics, as it were, as ultimate reality and then say that, by the way, we can still hang on to evolutionary theory, which deals with the kind of macroscopic objects that physics doesn't really, or post-classical physics doesn't have any track with.